You know, one of the things we were talking about with Tate and the Manosphere was just how everything's outward. Right. And then we started talking about beards. Right. But then you look, you do, you start researching beards, and there's this glorious, like, reformed history <laughs> of the beard and defense right. of the beard. Right. And And yet, so I think we... I think we go back, we talk about Tate, we talk about the outward, the bling, just that whole muscles right. ridiculousness that we were trying to point out last time and that they're, that true strength is resisting the devil. And then talk, and then just pivot into talking about beards. Right. And beards is one of those things. And then, you know, there's so many reformed podcasts and, Websites having to do with with beards, right. and then of course there's Spurgeon's defense of beards, and some of them even sell their own beard oil. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed, that gets a little weird, though. Right, right. You start getting into the uh, uh, met- metrosexual. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like it's a bridge too far, man. Right. And so we'll talk about that, and then we'll, um, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the the positive aspect of it and i think the positive aspect of it is it demarcates you from pagan society right and that's why the the jews were told not to trim their beards is because the egyptians and the gentiles did right and they did so in homage to their false gods and so this created that distinction um <clears throat> and then and so we'll go into that and then we'll we'll come back around and say and give warnings on yeah that may all be true but you can still rest in the outward you can glory in the outward and if you've right. got a beard and you're timid what good does the beard do <laughs> you know right. if you have the beard and you're not a man if you have a i mean a man living in his parents basement can have a beard right Right. But a beard does not a man make. Right, right, because there are a lot of beards that look like a woman is wearing it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all. Uh, and <laughs> seen some of these guys with the, well, they have the goatee grown out, and it's like braided. Let's see, Leviticus nineteen twenty seven. Leviticus nineteen twenty seven says, "You shall not round off the side growth of your heads, nor harm the edges of your beard." So what are the edges of your beard? I don't know. <laughs> Some translations it says the corners of your beard and I don't mm-hmm. I don't know how you, you how a beard has corners. Let those lamb chops grow. But I just yeah, I think it just means don't trim your beard. Don't take the right. edge off your beard. Let it grow. Right. And so last time we were talking about the manosphere and <clears throat> we were talking about Andrew Tate and all of the intense push toward the outward and building muscles and being a strong man and having a certain look and appearance and wearing the right clothing and Mm. having Lamborghinis and houses. It's all outward show. And all of this outward show got us thinking about the fact that manhood Many would say it consists in those sort of successful endeavors. Right. If you have, if you can bench four hundred pounds, if you can, you know, make a mortgage payment that's up in the, you know, tens of thousands of dollars each month, all those things that manhood consists in that. And we we went to scripture and we looked at Titus chapter two, and made the case that. Actual masculinity and manhood consists in, you know, especially geared toward young men, it it, it uh, consists in resisting the evil one. It consists in overcoming the evil one. And the evil one tempts us, right, and tempts us to go after the flesh. And so really it is overcoming your temptations that the evil one um, puts upon you. That was First John. As well, not not simply Titus, Titus chapter two, but First John. So that got us. After I think we stopped recording, we started talking about beards, beards, yeah. beards, beards, beards. To beard or not to beard? To beard, 
to be. <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> Scripture deals with speaks of beards. You know, there there is that command, and and we would put that clearly into the ceremonial law. Right. This is not, that's in the same, Leviticus 19 is just a bunch of sundry laws. It's the one immediately that, it's either immediately preceding or after Leviticus 19.27 that speaks of beards. It's the one about tattoos and cutting of, of yourself. And, right. And diviners and magic and, you know, and so it clearly is, um, those are, directives from God to Israel to distinguish them from the surrounding pagan cultures uh, of that time. And so, but clearly I think we would put those into the, the ceremonial law. And, and so beards are not a necessary command Right. That we have to keep. It's not at the level of the Ten Commandments. It's it's not a moral law. Right. Um, there there was a purpose for these laws, and that purpose was for Israel, and that purpose was for distinguishing themselves from the nations that surrounded them. But it is not necessary. Right. It's like eating shellfish or pork or any of the other things we we do today. All of those laws were abrogated in Christ, and. Jesus declared all foods clean. Right. And so those right. things went away in Christ. So there's not we and so to have a beard or to not to have a beard is not really the question. Right. 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 But is there some godliness? Is there some virtue? Is there something good about men wearing beards? What do you think? Quick take. I, I think there is. Yeah, it's it's a uh, men grow beards. You know, that's something that women can't do. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's it's interesting. I mean, again, we want to be very careful in this, and we want to say, you know, this is you can glory in the outward, and and you can you can think that your manhood, your masculinity, consists in your appearance. And that's one of the pitfalls of the manosphere. Right. But on the other hand, there is some good utility to facial hair. Right. The time you save shaving, you could spend with, with your kids. There, That's true. You you could, <laughs> that's true. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, less mere time for men right. seems like a positive. So what is the utility beyond what you've just said? What is the utility of it? What does it do? What does it say for a man to wear a beard? If Israel did it to distinguish themselves from pagans, can we do it now to distinguish ourselves from pagans? No, because all the pagans are running around with them now too. Okay. It's it, yeah. It's tough when you look back at the time when I grew up. When I was a kid, if a man had a beard, that meant he was a, a middle class guy who worked hard, worked with his hands. You know, um, the clean shaven face that was more your businessman type look. You know, but uh, yeah, men with beards worked with their hands. So there was a class. There was a class thing distinction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, based upon facial hair. That's probably always been true. Yeah. You say no because everybody's running around with beards, and it is true that beards are very popular today, and especially big, bushy, you know, putting... Right. Lumberjack beard. Lumberjack beard, putting the beard oil on, you know, making sure it's fancy, and the, the handlebar mustache, and right. all these things. You see pictures. Um, it's sort of the hipster movement. I, there's a new name for hipster. Hipsters like 10 years ago, but beards are, are very popular all over the place. But on the other hand, I would say there is some utility to it as far as re resisting pagan culture because androgyny is the order of the day. And to grow a beard is to proclaim your masculinity. Right. 
it is that. Yeah, it might be fashionable and it might be hipster, but but a woman can't grow a beard, nor can a little boy. A man can grow a beard. Right. Not all men can grow beards. Right. I mean, some just can't, and that's right. that's fine. They're you know that again, that isn't the measure of that isn't the full measure of their masculinity. I doubt once I, I can't grow a big full beard. I've got a t- high and tight beard, okay? Yeah. But I do have some facial hair, and I don't think I could grow the giant, glorious beard of John Knox or of John Calvin or of Heinrich Bullinger. All, all right. the reformers seem to have these these glorious beards. Um, I read somewhere that there was a purpose in the reformers growing those beards. Because the Roman Catholic clergy were clean shaven. Right. And so the reformers, and I don't, you know, who's the guy who said this? Um, uh, Michael A. Vandenberg, in a book published by Erdman's back in 2009, Friends of Calvin, He's, he wrote, why did most of the preachers of the Reformation have beards, whereas the Roman Catholic clergy did not? One historian gives an interesting explanation of this phenomenon. He suggests that the Protestant clergymen had a need to demonstrate their patriarchal masculinity, while the celibate clergy of Rome did not feel that need. The Reformers married, established families, and grew beards. This also enhanced their authority when they preached because it made them look like Old Testament prophets <laughs> who all were assumed to have beards. We do know that Heinrich Bullinger was one of the most impressive figures among these bearded ministers, as is evident from the surviving portraits of him. And so you, we see there this, this parallel to the Jews of the Old Testament, distinguishing themselves from pagans. Here are the Reformers, distinguishing themselves from the Roman Catholic clergy. Hmm. And here today, there's a sense in which we can distinguish ourselves from all the sexual anarchy. Right. Well, and the Reformers, too, were um, looking back at the early church. And when you look at a lot of the uh, early portraits of... of um, early church fathers, they all had beards. When you look at, uh, like, artist renditions of uh, Gregory of Nyssa, or if you look at uh, uh, um, uh, Ignatius, uh, yeah, these uh, yeah. they all had beards. And I would imagine that the first few centuries of the early church, uh, you're um, thinking more about uh, surviving persecution than you are prettying up your face with a razor. But yeah, it's almost like the beard with the reformers was kind of a, um, uh, kind of a, just giving them a finger to the to the Roman Catholic institution. Well, and it's interesting that this guy, this whoever he is, I mean he he says one historian. He's obviously quoting somebody else or leaning on somebody else, but he doesn't mention who that historian is. But he even brings in the fact that they wanted to demonstrate their patriarchal masculinity as opposed to the Malakoi Roman Catholic, you know, effeminates. Right. And celibates. And celibates, right. They're they're wearing on their face their patriarchal bona fides. You know, it's, I mean, during the Reformation, here's Luther and all of these men um, William Farrell and um, Calvin himself coming out of the Roman Catholic context, many of them coming out of the priesthood themselves and getting married. Right. And it was radical. Right. You know, it was radical just that they would marry. The beards come along and sort of is, it's just like another layer of, uh, we're not with you anymore. <laughs> right. We are separate from you. We are distinct. And we're going to wear this everywhere we go. We're going to proclaim to the world that we're, we're masculine, we're patriarchal, we're married, we're Protestant, we're Reformed. Right. 
And the beard did that. Just the beard. Oh, yeah. There's utility and there's virtue. There's a message in the, in facial hair. I mean, there are other, other passages in scripture. I mean, we can, we can go to those, but right now what occurs to me is first Corinthians 11, where length of hair is mentioned as a distinguishing characteristic between men and women. So yeah, first, first Corinthians 11, where Paul is discussing head coverings, he also brings in uh, the length of hair and says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice nor have the churches of God. And so right there, we're seeing that again, the length of hair, we're not talking about beards now, but hair on the head, proclaims male and female. And nature itself, the Apostle Paul says, nature itself teaches you that it's a dishonor for a, for a man to have long hair. Now, what did he mean by that? I mean, who knows? We could get into a debate about shoulder length or down the back or yeah. maybe, maybe he was going bald. So I think again, to, you know, to go positive on this, having a beard, having a big bushy beard is saying to the culture, look, we're not going to play your games. There's male, there's female and, and you can see it. You can look right at me and I'm proclaiming my patriarchal masculinity. That's right. You don't have to guess my pronouns. <laughs> no, no guessing a pronouns. I mean, one of the most garish things that what we see today is these transgender dudes right. who everything about them, they make look like a woman, but then they retain the beard. Yeah. That's weird. That it is, it is so jarring that they would, uh, send that mixed signal. But again, it's, it's androgyny, right? right. They're playing a woman and even retaining on their face their distinguishing characteristic as a man, right? And so it's it it's it's garish, it's it's off putting, it's just terrible because of that wicked just juxtaposition between what is natural and what has been faked, right? And so it's, it just fits right in with all of the the anarchy, the sexual anarchy today. And so that makes me transphobic because I'd like a woman without a beard. Yeah, it does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Spurgeon, this is probably one of the, if you've looked into beards at all and just the reform obs reformed obsession with beards, you've come across this, this one by Spurgeon. But I want to read the, the first part of it because it's hilarious. This is from his lectures to his students, which if you're a, a pastoral student and you haven't uh, dipped into Spurgeon's lectures to my students, you should uh, quickly. They are very helpful, very practical. But he says this, from personal experience, I venture with some diffidence to give this piece of advice. If any of you possess delightfully warm woolen comforters, with which there may be associated the most tender remembrances of mother or sister, treasure them. Treasure them at the bottom of your trunk, but do not expose them to any vulgar use by wrapping them around your necks. If any brother wants to die of influenza, <laughs> let him wear a warm scarf around his neck. And then one of these nights he will forget it and catch such a cold as will last him the rest of his natural life. You seldom see a sailor wrap his neck up. No, he always keeps it bare and exposed and has a turned-down collar 
And if he has a tie at all, it is but a small one loosely tied, so that the wind can blow about his neck. In this philosophy, I am a firm believer, having never deviated from it for these 14 years, and having before that time been frequently troubled with colds, but very seldom since. If you feel that you want something else, why, then grow your beards. A habit most natural, scriptural, manly, and beneficial. One of our brethren now present has four years found this of great service. He has compelled he was compelled to leave England on account of the loss of his voice, but he has become as strong as Samson now that his locks are unshorn. <laughs> that is so wonderful. I, I don't know what he means by comforter. Early on and wrapping their necks with a comforter, I don't think he's talking about what we put on a bed and refer to as a right, comforter. A scarf or something. Yeah, of but that then nature. he mentions scarf later, okay. and so maybe it's maybe it was some sort of scarf, but clearly it was something worn around the neck. But just the way he's mocking that yeah, tells you to treasure it at the bottom of your trunk. Like if your yeah, mom leave it your, in storage. If your mom or your sister made you this and and, you know, and they want you to wear it to keep your little neck warm. He's like, you know, treasure it, but treasure it in the bottom of your trunk. Don't you dare bring that out. <laughs> and then, and then he, um, and then he goes on to give the example of the sh- sailor <laughs> never wrapping their neck, never getting sick. And, uh, and, and then in comes the beard. If you want to do something, if you want to cover your neck somehow, why don't you grow a beard? Yeah. And uh and it's that one phrase there that I see like on t shirts and hats, right? A, a uh a habit most natural, scriptural, manly, and beneficial. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that's all over the place. Yeah. I mean, people are making money off of making, you know, T shirts with that. Right. What we've been saying so far is it's it's not merely a fascination. Right. It says something. It says something clear. Again, to go back to Scripture, those well-driven nails of Scripture, when uh, it seems clear that when you wanted to grieve, you know, in addition to sackcloth and ashes, there was a shaving of the head and a shaving of the beard that would take place, and that would proclaim to people that you were in grief that that something terrible had gone on at the end of Ezra uh there's the tearing out of the beard you know in repentance and then i believe it's second samuel 10 when david sends an envoy he sends his men to a surrounding nation and they shave off half of their beards. And it's clearly a sign of humiliation, but this is from Second Samuel 10. Now it happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanun, his son, became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent some of his servants to console him concerning his father. But when David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites, the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think that David is honoring your father because he has sent counselors to you? Has David not sent his servants to you in order to search the city, to spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun took David's servants and shaved off half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips. And sent them away. When they told it to David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, Stay at Jericho until your beards grow, (laughs) and then return. I mean, don't even hang out here with us in the capital city. You know, just let your beards grow, and then you'll be respectable again, and then come back. David responds quite aggressively to the shaving off of his men's beards. And it was meant to humiliate. It was meant to humiliate them because it emasculated them. And then the cutting off of the garments at the waist. Right. Right. To expose them. I mean, it it was all meant to humiliate. And so again, there's beards right at the center of 
effeminacy or emasculation and and those beards mean something they're saying something important Jesus had a beard right right Isaiah 56 50 verse 6 I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Right? So it may have been that those soldiers, those Roman soldiers that were beating Jesus about the face were also pulling at his beard and pulling the hair out of his beard. And again, that would be similar to what happened to David's men. It would be a form of humiliation. Before we before we start making some some applications and coming back around about the manosphere and the obsession with beards. There's Augustine. There are some details of the body which are there for simply aesthetic reasons and for no practical purpose. For instance, the nipples on a man's chest and the beard on his face, the latter being clearly for a masculine ornament, not for protection. This is shown by the fact that women's faces are hairless, and since women are the weaker sex, it would surely be more appropriate for them to be given such a protection. Who knew that Augustine addressed that age-old question of why do men have nipples? Right. (laughs) He says they serve no practical purpose. They're (laughs) simply there for aesthetic reasons. That's from the city of God. Without them, their chests would be pointless. He also said, this is Augustine, the beard signifies the courageous. The beard distinguishes the grown men, the earnest, the active, the vigorous. So that when we describe such, we say, he is a bearded man. And before him, Clement of Alexandria Clement said, How womanly it is for one who is a man to comb himself and shave himself with a razor for the sake of fine effect and to arrange his hair at the mirror, shave his cheeks, pluck hairs out of them, and smooth them. For God wished women to be smooth and to rejoice in their locks alone growing spontaneously as a horse in his mane. But he adorned men like the lions with a beard and endowed him as an attribute of manhood with a hairy chest, a sign of strength and rule. Right. I mean, there we go again. Right. Everybody, everybody is saying that, that this is not just a matter of aesthetics, that there, there is something well, it's not something. It is a proclamation that a man is a man and that a man is not a woman and that there's a distinction between male and female. And so the, the ubiquity of beards today, I mean, it'll be a fad. It will change. But the ubiquity of beards today is wonderful in the sense that it, it pushes back against the, the joke of the, the wickedness of androgyny. Yeah. And then there's uh, another quote by Clement of Alexandria where he says, This then is the mark of a man, the beard. By this he is seen to be a man. It is older than Eve. It is the token of superior nature. It is therefore unholy to desecrate the symbol of manhood. Hairiness. Hairiness. (laughs) Really. (laughs) The symbol of manhood is hairiness. You know, it is awkward when you run across like a swimmer because swimmers shave everything off their body so that they don't have any drag in the water. Right. Right. And so you see a guy who's got shaved legs and shaved arms and shaved chest and makes him like a, a porpoise in the water, which is helpful to them as far as, uh, their speed, but it's unmasculine. Right. It's awkward. It's strange. It doesn't doesn't seem right. I understand it, and I'm you know, but it it says something. So what do we, let's let's come back to the question of 
of beards then we've we've spoken very positively of it but after after last week we were sort of all negative on that because there's a there's a feminacy that can be stoked by the by paying attention too much about how you look right many men will spend a lot of time caring for their beards. Right. right. And it's clear that it's not just a beard where they haven't cut the edges off. It's a beard where they have styled every part of it. Right. You've taken all this time to grow out something masculine so that you could feminize it. (laughs) Yeah. So you pour beard oil in it and it Mm. smells like a pine forest. (laughs) And it glistens. If the sun shines on it a certain way and it's perfect, you know, the mustache is perfectly distinct from the rest of the beard, maybe turned up on the corners and the edges into a a, a sort of nice, happy. And, and then you can tell that other guys have seen pictures of reformers or they've seen pictures of generals from the civil war and they're imitating those men and just want to have, you know, a, a Stonewall Jackson sort of look. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I mean, um, we can get a little too fancy about this and we can become a dandy, right. you know, just a guy who's really careful about how he looks. And that's, that is effeminate. Being very careful about the way you look uh, quickly can pivot over into effeminacy. Being uh, narcissistic in that respect. Again, there's danger in the outward. There's danger in in posit- you know in in trying to fulfill your masculinity through the outward. That's where the manosphere goes off the rails. And the obsession with beards can can be the same thing. Now, we've just spent a lot of time talking about how it proclaims something good and, and, that, and we ought to proclaim the differences between the sexes today. That's absolutely necessary. The manosphere just lives in the outward, and we don't want to do that. I would, I mean, what would it say if we were teaching our sons that, you know, to become a man, you'll, you'll have a beard someday. I mean, it'd be such a joke, yeah. right? It'd be such a joke to maintain that right? and not teach them to overcome the evil one, not teach them to fight their sins, not teach them to protect women, not teach them all the other aspects of godly masculinity right that the manosphere knows nothing about yeah they think just by sporting a little scruff on their face that they're a man because you haven't taught them anything else yeah. I, 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 th- I think you're right though about the whole culture thing i think we're probably going to see more and more beards as more and more young men become defiant of, of the the uh, cultural narrative it's always kind of been a symbol of something. We talked about that a little bit um, last week when I was talking about Julian, Constantine's nephew, who he, uh, when he took rule, he, he he was opposed to the Christian faith and he tried to bring uh, the pagan worship back into Rome. And then uh, the Romans were really you know, had had this idea about their leaders that they should either be clean shaven or have it real high and tight, you know, trimmed. And he just grew out this huge beard and, uh, they, they, <laughs> they all mocked him and he ended up writing a book called the beard haters, you know, cause haters going to hate, you know? Um, but from their perspective, uh, a beard kind of symbolized, philosophers you know people who spoke mm-hmm. spoke in the in the um in the public square you know the right. uh, idealists and that's kind of what julian fancied himself as a philosopher king you know and so uh 
so yeah, he had this huge bushy beard and everybody hated him for it. <laughs> wow. Those who can grow a beard will emphasize beards. Right. Those who can kickbox will emphasize blood sport. Those who can build muscle mass will emphasize bodybuilding. Right. Right. What whatever you're you're good at or you're blessed with becomes your boast. Right. Right. And so it might be helpful for some of these men who have glorious beards to actually shave their beard because they're just taking pride in it. Right. But so many men will lead into it and make it a boast and almost like this quasi requ requirement to a new sort of, um, I don't know, a new sort of law that needs to be kept. And that's ridiculous. But we all do things like that. What we, where we are currently winning, where we are currently growing, will have a tendency to, to emphasize that and push other people toward it. And this is one of the difficulties of preaching, right? If you, if you get up and you preach with a bad conscience, you're going to pull your punches in certain areas, right? If you just had a week where you've been whining and complaining in your home, you've been yelling at your kids, the last thing you're going to do on a Sunday morning is, with that bad conscience, go up and tell tell the fathers how to love their children. Right. <laughs> he, right. And, you know, anger is, is sin. He's, he's going to pull his punches there. And, you know, this – on the flip side of that, where we're doing well, we'll have a tendency to to emphasize that as being the key to godliness, right? Whatever that may be. Again, you've been you've been doing daily devotions. You've been gentle with your children. You've been a good father in the home. You've been encouraging, and so you're gonna pour you're gonna pour out on that on a Sunday sermon and say, look. You've got to be encouragers to your children. You've you've right. got to do this because your conscience is is good there. Where it gets very dangerous, where that gets very dangerous, is when when scripture clearly says something, and because of your conscience, you either avoid it or you overemphasize it because your conscience is good there, right? Right, rather than preaching the word, right, and rather than working through your well i mean the people people don't think that pastors get up in the pulpit with bad consciences which is just crazy right right do you ever have a bad conscience all the time do you but sin of course i do do pastors <laughs> sin of course they do do pastors have a bad conscience after they sin they should yeah yeah well they should Unless they have a seared conscience, right? Right. But pastors have to get up there and often, and hopefully often, they're honestly exhorting themselves. Right. Yeah. When you're under conviction, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, belt out uh, something that you you yourself are not abiding in. You know. So that's where the conflict is w with guys like we were talking about, like Andrew Tate, these guys in the manosphere, you know, he, he preaches this great gospel of, uh, men defending women and men should be, uh, family men and all this, but Hey, a Bugatti only seats two. The man's 36. He's never been married and he's not heading in that direction. So he's preaching that to his audience, but he's not going anywhere near it himself. Right. Right, and he's just a flat-out hypocrite yep. because he's oppressing women as he's talking about protecting them. Right. right. And I don't know if Andrew Tate talks about protecting women. I, I don't think he does, but others I, I, do. I've heard several of, uh, several of the interviews that, that he has done, and yeah. he's very adamant about the protection Is of women. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, my. So, yeah, that's, that's why it's so strange to me that, that he speaks this, you know, protection of women and building up young men. And then, like I said, turns around and makes money off of webcam by exploiting women and tearing down young men. Yeah. You know, and I haven't heard anybody that has said, you've got to have a beard. 
You know, no. like the Amish would say. I mean, I think there's right. some sort of legalistic requirement. Right. And I haven't heard any reformed guys say, you got to have a beard. And and there are good reasons to do that. I think the popularity of beards may, may not be as deep as what we've said. It may just be imitation, right? right? Their heroes have beards. The men that they hang out with have beards. And so they're going to have beards and – and it's just camaraderie. But right. I, I, so I haven't heard any sort of legalism, but like with everything, we can make it a form of, of legalism. We make the outfits required, right? And so, like, if you go to a PCA general assembly, it's like all the pastors have the same wardrobe. It's weird. Like, there's this pastor's outfit, you got to have the lights leather shoes and you you got to have the certain coat of a certain color and and everybody begins imitating the men they see up there on the stage yeah. and whatnot and uh you know i i don't know what to do with that i'm i'm not completely condemning it um we all imitate those whom we respect in those ways right. it's when it becomes a requirement when it becomes sort of a, a standard that that has to be kept in order for you to have masculine virtue, where I say no, that's wrong, that's going too far. Um, but again, it 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 sounds like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. It's like, do you want to resist pagan culture? Well, grow a beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to? Uh, do you want to be godly? Well, it's it's inward and not outward. You know, and so maybe, maybe I am speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but you want to resist pagan culture, get married, have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Be beard's the easy part. Yeah. A beard is inevitable if you don't shave. There's very little challenge to it. It merely is a symbol. Right. right? But marriage will rock you to the core. <laughs> If you want to learn how to be a man, uh, woo a woman, court her, date her, marry her, and then lead her, and it will take every fiber of your strength to do so. Yeah. And you'll fail, 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 and you'll have to repent. And through that whole process of repenting and trying again, you'll grow in the Lord. Right. And that's, that's masculinity is taking on that responsibility. But the responsibility level of a beard, minimal. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to say the body means nothing. We can't ever do that. God made the body. It's good. Right. And God made women with distinct body parts and men with distinct body parts. And one of those distinctions is facial hair. Right. And that is good. Spurgeon, to to counter what he said before, did did say in one of his sermons, "You cannot measure a man's grace by the length of his beard, nor by the number of his years." You know, it, it's it it it's so easy. It it is not an indication of a man's godliness, and nor is age necessarily. A demonstration of godliness, though we are to respect those with the gray hair, right? And with time comes, and with experience comes wisdom, generally, but not all, not always the case. You can have a foolish old man, yeah. right? And you can have a godless, bearded man, right? <laughs> I mean, it seems so absurd to say that. It, it's so obvious, but but man, we are so vain. You know, we think that by what we wear, by our hairstyle, by our beard length, that we are projecting to people some sort of indication of our quality, of our excellence, of our virtue and godliness, and it's it's just not the case. We may very essentially be proclaiming our masculinity. That in and of itself is a good thing. But 
it is not at all necessarily a proclamation of any godliness at all. Right. And what about William Wallace? He said, return to your friends and tell them that we came here with no peaceful intent, but ready for battle and determined to avenge our own wrongs and set our country free. Let your masters come and attack us. We are ready to meet them beard to beard. (laughs) (laughs) William Wallace. And then there was the one that you sent me, the ancient Hebrew proverb. A woman with a beard looks like a man, and a man without a beard looks like a woman. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you have it. I mean, it, it is it is tied in with our sexuality. Yeah. So I again, I I'll just I'll say it again. And we've said it many times, but that's the glory of the beard today. Yeah. I I mean, but it's a mixed message because. It says a lot of things, and it could say that you're a hipster. It could say that that you're a conservative. It could say that you're a Civil War buff. It could say a lot of things. Right. But it will say, if that beard is authentic, yeah. it will say you're a man. That's right. And that should be your intent. That should be what you're saying when you grow one. I'm a man. I'm not going to shave for six years. <laughs> It'll be nasty. It'll just be like this. <laughs> Whenever I do have a clean shaved face, you'll you you'll know why. And uh, you say, "Oh, Jeremy's daughter told me shaving." I, my wife has never seen my chin. We've been married for 25 years. We met 26 years ago. She has never seen my chin. Oh, well, you can't ever shave it then. She would be frightened. Actually, she hasn't seen my chins. Yeah.